everybody. Here we are. All right. The numbers are going up. How are you guys doing? Um, any questions to start off with? So, yesterday, woke up in the morning and I had a comment from some from a trumpet player that I admire a lot. <clears throat> he gave me a thumbs up. I don't mean a literal thumbs up. I mean, he on one of my videos he told me that I he, I think he said preach or something like that, which I take that as a compliment. Hello. And um, yeah, so it was nice. He said that it was great advice. So someone that's up big like that, I think he's in, uh, he used to be in the New York Philharmonic. I don't know where he's at right now. He might be in New York, but then I think he left New York. Um, I don't know where he's at now. But yeah, it was nice to hear from someone like that. Wow. Not that I am a respecter of persons. And I wouldn't even be saying that if I didn't know him, right? I got to meet him just one or two times here in Houston when he was in the Houston Symphony. So um, he's a very nice guy, too. So hello. I can't say that. Er, er, her, er, Malaysian. I can't say that. You know, the problem is, is I don't know what the language is. I know basics of pronunciation for different places, but I can't always tell the spelling. And then I, I was trying to pronounce one of the screen names one time, and the guy told me, that's just some word I made up. <laughs> How many sides does a triangle have? Yeah, I think you need to go to a math. <laughs> a math chat, huh? All right. Any questions besides how many sides does a, ha a triangle have? I think we should know that answer, right? Three sides. Any other questions? Oh, is this a joke or something? He says, no, it's not three sides. So you're going to tell us what the answer is? All right. So um, what other news? So I finally cleaned up my room. Ha. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote the blog for this this morning, for this chat, and um, talking about the. I, so I look forward to the chat, right? I look forward to the Q and A, and I compared it to back when I was going through a divorce, back in two thousand. What was it? Two thousand three, I think it was somewhere around there, and. <laughs> um, you know, with this COVID-19 stuff, and I keep calling it hysteria and all that, right? Because, I, you know, I, I don't talk about that stuff except for how it affects the music, right? And it's getting harder and harder to not talk about it because it's consuming the music. You know what I'm saying? And... There are certain aspects of the um, the whole COVID thing that remind me so much of the divorce, <laughs> right? And there's, you know, they talk about the grief cycle, right? And I've gone through different cycles with this COVID stuff. And it's been, yeah, it's been... So I get angry sometimes, and then I get, I don't get depressed ever, but um, more like 
darkly frustrated, right? And, um, but anyway, yes, <laughs> I think I got a little dark on the, on the blog side of this. Uh, hello, Anthony. Nice to see you. Um, got a question. <laughs> Trumpet gods are being a problem again. <laughs> this coming week, my wife's birthday is my your wife's birthday, and she wants to go to San Antonio, and that means three days of no practice. Okay, so what's your question? I'm going to be going to San Antonio, San Antonio too. I want to write a, a trumpet composition based on the, um, what do you call it? Based on the missions down there. And do like a multimedia presentation. Have photos and stuff like that. And maybe some of Pearl's artwork. I would love to do that. And I think people would be interested in that, right? Like my pe maybe people in San Antonio would want to perform it. So, yeah, I'm planning on going to San Antonio like two or three times before the year is out. Maybe some other places too. I'm assuming, Anthony, that you're typing your, your question. So I hope you guys are having a, a a good day. I hope your week was went well. Looking forward to the weekend, right? Ah, there it is. This is from Anthony. Well, I have a lesson coming up Saturday. Also have to learn... Christmas music for my recital and my community band is supposed to meet this coming Tuesday, November 12th. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. So are you wondering how to fit it all in with, 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 um, well, I'll let you finish your question. Sorry. I have a bad habit sometimes, especially with my son is I'll, in my question, I'll have the answer. <laughs> it's like I answer the question for him or, or I'll ask him the question on his behalf or something, you know. Shouldn't do that. It's good you're that involved with the Christmas, I mean, with the uh, band stuff, right? It looks like you've got more gigs than I do. I'm kidding. Oh, with masks. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, I have a gig tomorrow, and I'm I'm wondering about that, right? Are they going to make us put stuff on our horn and stuff like that? Of course, not when we play. Sure. Well, they have masks with slits in it that you can put the mouthpiece in. The whole thing, in my opinion, see, I don't talk about this stuff, right? I only talk about it if, if it has something to do with what we do. So now there it is, right? When you look at the so-called science, and I'm not talking about the regular science out there that everyone's already talking about. I'm talking about the band science, right? Some of the orchestras have hired um, scientists to come in and do experiments with the band and stuff like that. But when you read the experiments, when you read the results and, and how they did it and how it's set up and all that, it's, it doesn't account for I, I don't know. I should probably shouldn't be talking about that. 
Your question is, is it okay to miss three days of practice? Yes, it's always okay to miss three days of practice. You won't hear that from most other trumpet players, but that's how I see it. You know what the thing is? I think sometimes, and, and I don't think this is intentional, I think sometimes the way people teach is on the assumption that you don't have the willpower to do as much as you can do. I think they assume that. So if they tell you to do as much as you can, then you're always going to fall short of that, and therefore you're going to practice the right amount. I think that's how most of my teachers, that I think that was their philosophy. They may not have thought of it that way, but I think... That was the underlying principle. Oh, she doesn't think it's a good idea? Um, that's fine. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm probably the only one that you'll ever talk to who says, go ahead and do that. Well, I shouldn't say only one. I, I didn't make this up. I had a, a, a teacher that, that blew my mind one time, Dick Schaefer. He's, he... He told me he was taking four or five days off one time, and this is when he was second trumpet of the Houston Symphony, taking four or five days off because he had such a hard week the week before. Um, and he told me this because we were in the lesson, and I think he was explaining to me, it's been a long time now, I think he was explaining to me um, why he wasn't going to play in the lesson because he was taking time off. And that's when I learned that he takes two weeks off a year. Hello, Gabriel. Oh, yeah. So Anthony says, no, I heard a pro player giving a master class saying it's okay to miss a, two, a week or two. So... I, so, yeah, I guess there are people out there. It's just not so common. And you're right. It is a trumpet god thing. And let me be clear about what the whole trumpet god thing is. I know we've talked about it before. Um, no, it comes from, it started off with me teaching that wholesome priority thing, right? Where Where should music fit into your, life and i say that their top priority should be your faith and and i i use the word faith it could be belief so and you don't even have to, even have to be religious you that very top thing should be like whatever moral code you live according to that should be the very first most important thing in your life right so and the way priorities work right the, the way priorities work and, and and anthony you're giving us a great example here the way priorities work is you say that something in this category is more important than something in this category. So when there's a conflict, when there is a conflict, you go with the higher priority. And with my students, normally trumpet should be fifth on their priority list. For me, it's fourth on my priority list because this is my job. That's the only difference between me and the rest of you guys in terms of priorities. Faith is still first, health is still second, family is still third, but the fact that I have a job doing this is um, putting it just one step higher on the priorities because I have to make a living, right? So when you look at the whole trumpet god thing in the context of these priorities. So does that, you see what I'm saying? That's where the whole trumpet god thing started, kind of. I did start it like earlier than that, but for now, this is, this is where it started, is saying, you know, if you put trumpet first in your life over all things, you're basically saying that's your religion, that's your faith, that's your belief. And then all that other stuff that we've talked about in that context, 
has been in support of that idea that it should not be your, your main thing that you believe in. I mean, it should not be your religion. Okay, and we can go into why later. But so, um, and, and the basic reason is because it makes you a horrible player. Really. And you know what? I wish I had saved it. There was a violinist quote that I had just stumbled upon online. And it said that no nobody should practice more than two or three hours a day. Because, and I'm paraphrasing here, because you should live your life first. Without living your life, you have nothing to express in your music. Now, I, I've been practicing more than two or three hours a day for not recently, but I went like almost 30 years practicing more than two or three hours. But the concept is still there, right? Um, so when we talk about the trumpet God thing, you know, once we establish that trumpet can be that top thing, you know, if you get your life messed up, that trump top thing can end up being trumpet or music in general. And that can really um, be a problem. So like, for example, what you're talking about here, right? Three days off. If you are one of those that worships the trumpet God and believe that you have to do this or else the trumpet God will punish you, right? Um, you know, and, and, and see, the thing is, is what you believe comes true. So you take the three days off. If you believe that it's going to make you sound terrible, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and you get back and um, you end up do sounding bad because that's what you believe. But I'm evidence that if you don't believe that, you don't have to sound bad after you've taken three days off. Okay? Anyway, I hope that makes sense. Um, Alex says, hi, Eddie. Howdy. How are you doing? Um, what's your main instrument? I know you play trumpet, but what kind? Bach, Yamaha, etc. So my main trumpet is the Bach. It's actually put away right now. Um, it's the same horn that Gabriel plays. It's a 72 large bore with a reverse pipe. I think it's got the lightweight, lightweight bill. It's a Bach Stradivarius 72, model 72. Um, and it's... I've, it's a reverse pipe. I wanted the reverse pipe because the, the theory in my mind about the reverse pipe is that you have more continuous, uninterrupted airflow. So that's that's why I like the reverse pipe. Okay. Um, Anthony says, I am going to San Antonio anyway. I love my wife more than the trumpet cause. Well, congratulations. I hope you have a good time over there. Louis Armstrong must have taken time off to go to San Antonio. <laughs> yes, Louis Armstrong probably took time off. Actually, I don't know that. There are some, some of the greats, right? Some of the greats have gone without time off. You know, I think, and I don't want to say who they are, um, but there are some that believe that you should never take time off. Um, but I just don't agree with it. I don't believe it. And what I see in my career in, and in my students, it's not, it's not, it doesn't uh, come out as being true. Um, Gabriel says you can always free buzz. That's true. You know, the thing about the free buzz, so yes, you can do that. Um, I used to do that, right? As I got older, what was it? You know, since I've told you guys about the divorce, the after my divorce and I met my new wife and she's living in South Africa, my first trip, I think, was about three weeks, maybe. And that was the first time without needing a break that I went the whole time without playing. Um, and, and 
I didn't do any lip buzz or anything like that to stay quote unquote in shape or anything. It was like three weeks or a month or something. I got back and had a tough gig with the band I'm playing with tomorrow. After that three weeks off, I did a warm up before the gig. No problem. No chop problems, no mental problems. You know, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you get foggy in the brain, right? And so like, and for me personally, what that affects most is my improv. When I get foggy in the brain, the, the, the ideas don't flow so well. But I didn't have any trouble after after an extended break. Um, I, I made it to where the flight came in the day before the gig. So there was no time to get, there was no time to get back in shape. And I played that hard gig and there was no problem. So I don't do, when I'm on the road or whatever, I don't do any lip buzz. I don't, I just take the whole time and just relax, spend that time with the family, enjoy um, the sightseeing or whatever. I love to be on the road. I don't know if I ever told you guys that. I love to be traveling. I love to be out there doing that. I don't even need to be going somewhere. Sometimes I'll just drop my wife off and go, right, just for a ride. Try to get on some other roads I hadn't been on. Um, Anthony says, it's all in your mind is what you mean. Uh, sort of. I think it's more than that. I think it's – so we're talking about the practicing thing. Like if you think you're going to sound bad, then you're going to sound bad. And, yes, there is a psychological perspective uh, uh, aspect to it. But I also think there's a spiritual aspect to it. And I won't get too deep into that, right? But I do believe there's a spiritual aspect to it. And when you claim something with your mouth, when you say something – It has power, okay? That's why you're supposed to be very careful about what you say. Uh, but I do believe that there is power in the spoken word. Javier, nice to see you, Javier. I'm doing good, thank you. Alex asks, do you think a Zeno is a good trumpet? Yes, sir, I do. It's made by Yamaha, if you don't know. Yes, I know about the Zeno. Um, you know... I might have ended up playing Zeno or something like that. All my other horns for a long, long time were Yamahas. Um, I had my Bach B flat, but my Piccolo and my E flat and my um, Flugelhorn were all Yamahas. Gabriel says, sometimes I overdo with free buzz and can't play horn <laughs> the day after. Yeah, you got the. You know, that's good and it's bad. It's, it's Now, remember that the reason why I teach lip buzz is not for strength. I teach lip buzz so that your brain has more stuff to process. That's why in my lip buzz, we're doing different things, right? So we do arpeggios. <laughs> Right? We're doing different arpeggios, we're doing intervals, we're doing scales, and that's not there to build strength. It does help build strength, but more importantly, that's there to give your brain more data to process. That's all it is, is it gives your subconscious mind just a little bit more data to process, okay? Okay. That's my take on that. It's not for strength. Now, you can use it for strength, and it's very effective. So that day that you did that actually probably increased your strength after that once you had that rest afterwards. So I'm not saying thou shalt not do it. It's actually a wonderful way to build strength. Um, it can be overdone. Uh but when I say overdone, I mean like you can do it too often, like days in a row, too many hours and stuff like that. Um, Anthony says, Louis Armstrong's trumpet 
was up for auction in New York. Yeah, I saw that. I think it is, but I never found out how much it went for. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really interested in that kind of. I when I see the headline, I make note of it, but I just keep scrolling down. I'm not. I'm not really all that interested in. And that's because of my attitude about celebrities and stuff like that. Um, I was brought up to that you teach you treat everybody the same, whether you're famous or not famous, whether you're a good person or a bad person. You know, you treat people um, with the same dignity and respect. Maybe not good person, bad person. I don't know why that came out. But yeah, I think you get my point, though, right? And um, so if some dude played a horn, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I think it's part of that. You know, I think that's why famous people like me. There are there are certain famous people. I don't mention their name because I think that's one of the reasons they like me is because I don't go, <gasps> oh, right. Of course, I did that at the beginning of this chat, but I didn't tell you who it was. Right? So, um, and it wasn't because he's famous. It was because I admire him. And it was great to hear this. It was sort of like getting feedback. Um, so, Gabriel says, when I am far from the trumpet, I imagine to blow in everything. I drink a Coke in the bottle and I consider the rim is if it's if the rim is comfy or not that's you know I, I i think i can understand that i think i can understand that javier says what about the con constellation 38b is that a good trumpet yeah you know that's a very different if you're talking about the old one you know some of these horns they're remaking but yes the 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 old one like from you know, the old model, I mean, um, it has a different sound because it's, it's a smaller horn. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the lead pipe's smaller, the, um, the bore is smaller, so it's got this more compact sound. Let's say I have more free time and I already, this is Javier, and I already did the daily routine. Should I use the free time playing music or etudes or both. Um, so I consider etudes music. Unless the etudes just going ta 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 If it's just doing stuff like that, maybe not. But normally I consider etudes music. So like any of the main etude books, I consider that music. So yeah, you don't you don't have to choose between those. Either way is fine. Anthony says, true, but Louis Armstrong came across as a very kind person. Yes, that's true. Yep. He was a very, very nice guy. So I read his autobiography. And you know, it's funny. They tell people that um, you shouldn't read autobiographies because they're inaccurate, which makes sense, right? Because you're, what you're getting is how somebody remembered it. And uh, a true uh, researcher can actually get dates and stuff like that and tell you what really was. But when I read the autobiography, I wasn't trying to find out the real details. I was trying to get to know him. And when you read it, it sounds like he's talking. It's a great book. Gabriel says, Eddie, what's your favorite exercise? And go with the flow. Um, wow, that's a hard one to answer. Let me pull it out and see. What's my favorite? Wow. That's definitely a question nobody's ever asked me before. <laughs> What's, what's your favorite out of the book you wrote? Um, let's see here. Uh, 
I like number 16. The one in 5-4. That's very nice. So, definitely my favorites, plural, tend to be Why did I not do a, a one in... Oh, that's right, that's right, that makes sense. So my favorite ones tend to be the last ones up to 16. But let me see what I would think is my favorite. Favorite. Um, I like 13 a lot. 13 has an African rhythm to it, right? Except I didn't know how to do it back then. I didn't I didn't quite understand the African rhythm quite yet. So it's off by two beats, but that's fine because I wrote it. So yeah, so that people can just like... <laughs> so my favorites range from number nine to 16. But I have to say that probably the 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 African one is probably my favorite. Let me see if I can. It's been a couple years since I've played this. Let's see what it sounds like. I won't do the whole thing, but you'll get the to help you get the groove of it. few mistakes but yeah it's got that that some of the jazz guys would call that african 12 8 feel um i hate talking about grooves that way that's not it reminds me of a story i won't say it um but you know academics tend to be very much like that oh they do 12 8 very good right <laughs> So, um, but yes, I like that one. Alex says, what's a good schedule way to follow for practicing etudes? My all in phase one is coming up next week. Okay, so I teach seven different stages of practicing music, right? The first stage is to study the music. The second stage is to work backwards, not forward. Work backwards. Learn the last measure and work your way to the beginning. And there's psychological reasons why we do that and also practical reasons why we do that. Um, I won't go into details for that. I would like to make a working backwards video. But it's part of this book that I'm about to publish sometime. It was supposed to be published in February and... Um, I decided to hold on to it for a while. It's actually finished, by the way. It just needs to be edited. And, um, but the editing part was probably going to be kind of a pain in the butt. So, um, so that's the second stage. Third stage is to put sections together. Um, most of the time when, when you're doing etudes, you don't need that. So the third stage is kind of optional. Fourth stage is to play the music beginning to end without stopping, no matter how bad the mistakes are. And this is probably the stage what, that you would probably be at right now if you're only a week away. Okay. The, la the, 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 the fourth stage is to play it beginning to end without stopping, no matter how bad the mistakes are. If you make too many mistakes, it means you're going too fast. The, the tempo for all of this stuff should be between half and two-thirds tempo. And so that's, the, that's that stage. Then the next stage after that is to memorize the music. Is that memorize? Yeah, memorize the music next. 
And the way we memorize the music is to work backwards on it again, but this time without looking at it. Then after memorizing, um, we do what I call over-prepare. Over-prepare is when you do stuff in your practice session to try to emulate the stress of performing. So as an example, one example of over-preparing this, and this has to happen after you've done all the prepare, all the other preparation stuff. It's a waste of time if you try to do this earlier than that. But imagine doing a hundred jumping jacks and immediately picking up the horn and playing through the etude. That's what I mean by over-prepare. I also have a, a 20 pound weight vest that I have my students put on and it pushes down on their lungs and kind of makes them feel like they can't breathe. Um, I actually have a list of about 20 things that I do with the students. They get to pick and choose which ones they want to do. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that I teach for that. Anthony says, yes, I have a Con 22B. It has a small board, but it can play as loud and high as most trumpet from yours is from 1935 still plays still plays has a classical sound okay so yes th that's that's a myth that the bigger board plays louder i don't think it works like that i don't think it works like that so yes it makes sense that that the 22b would make would be louder alex says is there any particular horn you dislike ooh horns i dislike I don't know. Never really thought about that. I guess I don't have an answer for that. You know, I did have a student. <laughs> I had a student that brought in a cheap horn. I think it was a cheap horn. And it had no slot. And I like a horn that, can, that gives you wiggle room. This one has quite a bit of wiggle room, right? <laughs> this one had so much wiggle room. It was like you could bend the note up or down or whatever, and it was like, wow, you can you can barely play the instrument. So I don't know what it was, though. I can't remember. It was some off name. Um, Gabriel says, I think Go With The Flow is a very nice book. Well, thank you, Gabriel. You know, when I wrote that, I think I might have told you this before. I wrote the harmonies first. Then I wrote the A2 to fit the harmonies. Okay, so Javier says, my, I'm, I'm, I think GF is girlfriend, my girlfriend's son, he is eight, and I want to teach him trumpet, but I don't want to buy him a trumpet to end up locked in a closet, right? Is there a way to know if the little guy is going to persist? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you there. Um... You know, one thing I can tell you is that the most enthusiastic students, 90% of the time, end up not being the most dedicated students. Okay? Um, and you know what? I just read an article about that. And apparently this is like, in the business world, this is a thing that they talk about. There's a difference between discipline and motivation. And the problem with motivation is it goes away. So self-discipline keeps going and keeps going. Self-discipline is the, 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 the energizer bunny, right? Self-discipline, you can just keep going and going and going and going. Um, so a lot of times I can tell you, and I'm going to speak in great generalities because um, – because, you know, because I'm actually talking about real people here and I don't, I don't want to be offensive to anybody who might be listening. But the most enthusiastic students I've ever had are the ones that have the most trouble sticking with it. And, and 
I think enthusiasm has a lot of like backfiring effects. There's a lot of bad stuff that comes out of more enthusiasm. And on the surface, it looks great. Gabriel says, great honor for me to listen from you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Gabriel. Um, maybe I'll do some recordings and post them on, on YouTube because that was just like a, a throw together. I've been playing these. You know, there's, there's no reason it should have sounded that bad. But um, maybe I can put a proper recording of a few of them together and post them as videos um might even help sell the book a little bit javier says i ask you because you probably teach lots of kids yes i i've taught literally hundreds i stopped counting my students after 500 <laughs> right and that was in the 90s in the late 90s i i used to keep track how many students have i taught right um and granted, I teach a lot less than I did back then because I, I want to offer more quality, quality lessons in my lessons. I want to offer the students more quality time. And you can't do that when you're teaching that much. Not in my opinion. Well, at least I can't. Um, but yes, I've taught a whole bunch of beginners. A whole bunch. I would say at least two-thirds of my students have been beginners. And I'm actually very good at teaching beginners. But to answer your question, there's no way to know who's going to stick with it. I am always suspicious about the ones who are most enthusiastic. I'm always suspicious because I've seen it happen so many times. Um, Javier says, maybe I should buy him a 20 bucks bugle and see if the guy have any skills and interest. Make him learn the wake up call and see if he can nail it. That's one way to do it. Um, you know what I do with some of them? I don't even, so it depends on the student, right? It depends on the student. But sometimes beginners, you don't even want them to practice on their own. Let them come to the lesson, use your horn first. Well, maybe that's not a good idea, depending on the kid, right? <laughs> but but you get my point, right? Let him let him play, do the exercises, and then go home and forget about it. And then come the next week again. I've taught a lot of students that way, and they end up being really good players. And I think what happens a lot of times. And you really have to feel it out, right? That's one of my jobs as a teacher is to feel out the students, make sure that I'm not giving the wrong instruction to the wrong type of student, right? Because some students, it's better if they don't practice at home because they can make it worse with what they do at home. Other students, you can tell that they're catching on quickly, like they understand stuff. And... Those students are okay. You can send them home and give them an, ass an assignment, and, and it's all right. So really, you have to just get to know the student. Alex says, back to my question on practice, do you have a, a video on that? Um, <laughs> let me see here. No, I don't actually. I don't have a video. We're talking about those seven stages. I don't have a video on that yet. I've been holding off because, like I said, it's it's the new book, the the new new book. <laughs> so I've got other new books too, but and it's becoming a, a the whole book thing is becoming a huge mess. Um. So yeah, you know what? If more people bring that book, up, I will try to make it a priority. Uh, I'll, really, all I have to do is edit it and and get the cover done, and it'll be ready. It's like 160 pages or something like that, and it's all text. 
Um, it's a. I think it's going to be a great book. I think people are going to. It's going to be. It's the same kind of book as my one range book, but for learning how to practice music. And I think it's even more important than the one range book. The one range book is important. This is more important, and it's also this this book is also going to be a book that every musician can can use. It's not just for trumpet. So, anyway. Gabriel says, about the horns, it's not the arrow, it's the Indian. That's true. That's true. He's, Gabriel, Javier, uh, uh, Gabriel says, Javier, if pistons don't block it, means, means he plays. <laughs> Gabriel says, buy him a cornet, so if you don't have any and he doesn't play, you get a, a new horn. Javier says, does it make a big deal the position of the fingers that press down the valves? Yes, it, yes, it does. Um, looking at long term, right? <clears throat> What I tell my students is that the knuckles, and when I say knuckles, I'm talking about these knuckles, not these knuckles. The knuckles need to be over the valve tops, okay? Not down here. When, when, when you play down here like this, it's a lot more difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's a lot more difficult to get the valve to go straight down. And you start having this sideways wear on the valve. And when you wear that enough, you start getting these that, that looseness that and the valves start sticking and it's it's a nightmare. So I don't think I've done a video yet on my right hand position. Um, I might have told you guys this before, but I have a position that I made up. Oh. And what I did is I, to come up with this position, I let my hand uh, lay down natural like this, right? And then I lifted it up in that same exact position and put my horn here. And I noticed that this is where the thumb is. And so this is my most natural hand position. Now what's weird, when I teach that, I don't actually teach it that you should play this way. I teach that this is how you find your most natural position. You you let your hand hang loose, then pick it up without moving it. And that should be as um, very close to how you play. And the, the reason I came up with that position was because I was getting... Carpal tunnel syndrome, and um, in this hand, and at the time I was practicing uh, as much as eight or nine hours a day, uh, as much, you know, you know, you guys know my system. I don't practice the same amount every day, but as much as eight or nine hours on Tuesday. Okay, specifically Tuesday. Um, and to do that nine, eight or nine hours, I was actually, um, I actually quit bands for it. Sometimes I regret that, but no. Um, I regret not being in the band. I don't regret the benefit that I got from doing that. Does that make sense? So, um, but yes, so I was playing a lot on my horn, practicing a lot. And I was also... Um, using free weights, and I was also typing. I was spending a lot of time typing every day, and just what that was doing to my to my wrist, I couldn't open a doorknob, and something had to be done. So I got someone from the audience came backstage and told me because I, I was talking about the, the pain 
and he told me that I was playing like this. Now it didn't feel like this, and it didn't look like this. What I from where I was, you know, from my perspective. But when he pointed it out, I realized yes, I've been playing with my my wrist bent up like this, and that's the problem, right? Carpal tunnel is those those um, tendons are going through the sheaths. If they're going through the sheath and the sheath is bent like this, you're going to have wear and tear on the on the carpal tunnel. That's what carpal tunnel syndrome is. The carpal tunnel is a sheath that the that the um, tendons go through. And that gets inflamed from the friction. And that's where the pain comes from. So that's why I made up that, that hand position. Now, back in those days, nobody I knew played like that. Um, today, you see people every once in a while using my hand position. Now, that sounds kind of arrogant. Maybe they didn't get it from me, right? But I've been teaching it online since the 90s. So it makes sense that um, that, that hand position would take off and that some people would uh, start doing that. So the chances are that hand position was my hand position that I made it up. You know? Alex says, what would a good mouthpiece be for jazz? I don't work that way, right? I'll, I'll explain this in a second. Also, what's your opinion on cheater mouthpieces like a Bobby Shoe? Are you calling Bobby Shoe a cheater? <laughs> okay, first, let's answer the second question first. Most of my gigs, I play on a so-called cheater mouthpiece. They're not cheater mouthpieces, okay? I would never call that a cheater mouthpiece. Um... <laughs> Javier says that's not nice the cheater thing <laughs> we're just kidding Alex <laughs> we like to have <laughs> we like to have fun here huh um, sure I know well it's not just you a lot of people call it cheater mouthpiece Alex says, I know it's just what my friends and I call it. Yes, I know. That's that's a that's a thing. So anyway, um there's people that say you should do everything on one mouthpiece. And if that works for them, that's fine. It doesn't work for me. I have three mouthpieces. Let me go grab them so that you can see. I've done this before, but but I don't mind because this is one of those subjects that keeps coming up. So um, let's see. Oh, I don't know where my cheater is. Maybe in here. Okay, there's my C cup. Oh, there it is. I got it. <laughs> So I've had three mouthpieces since 1990. I always have a very deep one. This is so deep it goes to my knuckle, almost. Then I have a C cup one. That's this is I like I looked at this for a student because he tried it and he liked it, and but it's I think this is like a $200 mouthpiece if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, and I don't want him to buy a $200 mouthpiece, but it's just like a buck one. Size-wise, it's just like a buck one. Um, and then I have my cheater mouthpiece. This one is so shallow, okay, that it's, um, can probably get like one penny in there. It's very shallow. And so the way I do the mouthpiece thing, it has to do not with jazz. It has nothing to do with what style you're playing. I've used my cheater mouthpiece in classical groups. Okay? It depends on how loud the group is. 
So if I'm playing with a classical group, but it's real loud, then I'll play on this uh, very shallow mouthpiece. Um, now, why do I play this on almost all of my gigs? Like tomorrow night, the gig, this, this will be the mouthpiece I play on. And even, so tomorrow night, I might not be playing first, right? Because I stopped playing with that band, I guess about four years ago. And so he's, he only calls me now every once in a while. And so it used to be that I played lead for that band. Chances are I'm not playing lead anymore. And even though, let's say he puts me on fourth part. I don't know if he's hiring four trumpet players or not. But let's say hypothetically he puts me on fourth part. I will still use this mouthpiece. It has nothing to do with playing jazz. It has nothing to do with playing high. It has everything to do with playing in a loud group. And it has to do with the, the tone you get and how well it projects in the ensemble. If I played either one of these, it would be all tubby sounding and would not, it, no, it would be like, why am I even here? Right? So I use this for salsa gigs. I use it for top 40 gigs, wedding gigs. I use it for cumbia gigs. I use it for... Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, polkas, the German stuff, the umpa bands, German music, polka music, right? The reason I, I guess, what the reason I got, um, because here in Houston, we also call rancheras polkas, right? So, um, well, either way, if I'm playing a ranchera or or a German polka, I'm still playing this mouthpiece because the bands are so loud. Now, we talked about this last week or the week before. The bands are loud. And you just have to play on something that's shallower so you don't get lost. Your sound doesn't just get swallowed up by the band. Now, when I'm playing in a small ensemble or in a, a big band that doesn't have an electric bass, right? If the big band has upright bass and isn't playing really, really, really loud... So um, then I'll play this mouthpiece, which is basically a one mouthpiece. Even if I'm playing lead, I'm playing on this one mouthpiece in the big band. Because it has that beautiful, big, fat sound that I want in that big band playing lead. Then if the, if the group is even smaller, let's, just, let's say it's a combo and the combo is upright bass. If, if, even if it's a combo and they're playing like amplified instruments like the, a, a bass guitar and a really loud guitar, I'll still go to this one, right? Because even in that small setting, if they're all amplified and turning up, you're going to get lost in the sound. They won't hear you. But when it's a really, really small group and all acoustic and all that, that's when I go and I play on the, the, the deep, deep, deep cup. And the one that I practice with at home all the time is the deep, deep, deep cup. I don't practice this at home ever. I don't practice on the cheater mouthpiece ever. Okay? Never. <laughs> okay? I have to stress that. I don't practice on this. Ever. Got to stress that. I might practice sometimes on this, but probably not. I spend most of my time on this mouthpiece. And by the way, you might have noticed that it's a shorter mouthpiece. I read the literature on it. It is a mouth, uh, trumpet mouthpiece. It is not a cornet mouthpiece. It's got a trumpet shank. But it had to be shortened because there's so much volume inside that cup that it would play flat if it wasn't shortened. So they had to shorten it so the pitch would get raised up. But it is a trumpet mouthpiece. All right, so that's my take on mouthpieces. It has nothing to do with style. It has everything to do with how loud the group is. Okay? Um, when I play with... I have, in a couple weeks, I'm playing at the Texas Renaissance Festival. And when I play in the Texas Renaissance Festival with the brass quintet, I'll probably play this mouthpiece. Because it's, it's acoustic, right? Um, 
and it's a little bit too the the ensemble is a little bit too loud for this mouthpiece. Okay. Um. <laughs> Javier says it's just a mouthpiece. It's not steroids for jazz. <laughs> All right. I've seen people on one and a half C hitting triple C easy. Yeah. I do that easy. And on a big ma ma bathtub mouthpiece, bathtub horn. So that's bigger than a one and a half C by far. And I haven't played a super C like that since the last time I saw you guys. Wasn't it last week or the two weeks ago, maybe, uh, that I played a Super C for you? I haven't been playing. I only do that stuff on gigs. I don't practice up like that anymore. I used to. In the 90s, I practiced up to Super C. I have, so you guys will be interested in this because you guys know my books. I published for a short period what I called a book called Groups 8 and 9. It was supposed to be an extension of the Daily Routine book, and it went up to Super C. I didn't like the way people were treating it. They talked, They called it my high note book, and I took it off the market. I don't want people associating me with high notes. But yes, I used to have a book called Groups 8 and 9. Um... <laughs> Javier says, yeah, rancheras. They play that in my country, too. They are Mexican, right? Yes. Um, so we have different names. So, Javier, so rancheras come from Germany. Rancheras are German-influenced music. And I'm, I don't have the ear to hear the different styles, right? But supposedly there's a difference between Norteño music and Conjunto music and, um, and Rancheras. Supposedly those are three different styles. I can't hear the difference, okay? It might have something to do with the lyrics. Norteño music is, um, they all three have accordion. They all three have that same umpa beat. Right? Um, but those are supposed to be three different styles. And I can't tell the difference. Um, I remember my first band that I played with in Houston was originally a cumbia band, but only Mexican cumbias. Because, you know, there's cumbias in different countries, right? You have, like, the cumbia in... in, in uh, Colombia, like Pastor Lopez and those guys. Oh, actually, he's he's not Colombian, is he? Pastor Lopez, I think he's... Anyway, um, so cumbias in, in, in uh, Colombia sound, sound different from cumbias in, uh, in Mexico and cumbias in Texas. They're all three different styles, right? So that's, um, anyway, so yeah, they're all different, but they're, it's, they're still called cumbia. Anthony says, is it a good rule of thumb that to practice something slowly will make you able to play it faster? Yes, sir. That's always true. Slow makes fast. Fast makes slow. <laughs> I've never heard that, heard that, but yes, I agree with that. Meaning, do it too fast and you're going to make mistakes. That's correct. Well, what I would say for fast makes slow is that fast makes it take longer to learn. You learn things more quickly and you are able to play faster too. But when you slow something down, you learn it more, more quickly. If you try to play it fast, it's going to take you forever to learn it. And the reality is you probably never will learn it properly. Uh, Anthony says, my dog heard that high note you played. 
<laughs> and then Gabriel says his too. That's funny. Um, Javier says, don't know the difference either, but they are super fun. Yeah. You know, I... <laughs> oh, I was telling you about that band, right? So this band, it was called Promesa, and 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 Promesa, he was so proud of the fact that he doesn't spell it. So he spelled Promesa with two S's. And he that was that was the band's name, right? And he's like, he was so like, he thought he was so clever, right? Calling the band Promesa with two S's. And, um, but I was in that band for about a year and a half. And what they told me was that in Houston, up until that time, you had, the club scene was, was two different sets of clubs. You had the ranchera clubs and you had cumbia clubs. They didn't mix. The people who liked cumbias only heard cumbias, and the people who did the rancheras were only did rancheras, right? We were one of the first bands that did both. And then after that, everybody started doing that. And yeah, and that was that was my first regular band when I got into Houston. And and it what it was because of that band that got me into the salsa scene, and I played salsa primarily for my living. Most of my gigs from about 1990 to about 19, uh, to about 2010, I guess, about 20 years, was salsa. And I had, and I liked the kind of salsa gigs we did because we didn't really have a band. It was a pickup thing. What happened was they would bring artists in from out of town. We would have a rehearsal or two and perform with this famous artist. The, my list of famous artists under the salsa category, and I only started keeping track like after I had been playing for 10 years already. I have like this really, really long list of salsa stars that I've worked with because of that, because that's what, what we did. We, we were just a band, um, a pickup band that pe these guys would play with when they came into town. I guess that saved them a lot of money. My favorite salsa singer, Salsero, was, um, uh, oh, what's his name, the, the albino guy? Um, Cano Estramera. Cano Estramera. He's old school stuff. Beautiful, beautiful charts. Great singing. He does actual real, um, on the Montunos, he actually does real um, improv. And it's just, I've worked with him three times, and he's by far my favorite. I also played with a band called, um, They that, what was great about this band was that um, they had four trumpets. Real cool sound. Conjunto Chane. That was the name of that band. Conjunto Chane. Anyway. Yeah, my, <laughs> I have nostalgia, right? I love that music. All of it. I love, I love Tejano. I love rancheras. I love cumbias. I love salsa. All of that stuff. I don't. The fact that the gigs paid so bad, <laughs> I don't want to go back to that life again. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, it was bad. Um, that's why I could have so many gigs and still be under the poverty line. Anyway. Um, so, yes, Cumbia, this is um, Javier. Yes, cumbia is all different, also in Argentina, right? That's what I thought, in Chile. Um, but they all make you want to dance and be happy. That's exactly right. You know, if I'm on a long-distance trip and I'm starting to get tired, I put cumbias on. Cumbias will make you just like, you're, you're just driving down the road, and it's like you can go another five hours like that. <laughs> All right, Sparky says, this was in recommendation 
just saying hi. Hi, Sparky. Oh, Sparkly. It says Sparkly. Cero Auto. So, Cero, Cero Aura. Cero, Cero Aura. Just saying hi, howdy. Glad to find more trumpet YouTubers. Yay! <laughs> Um, any other questions? It looks like we're out of time. I didn't really even look at the time. Anyway, good. Nice to see you guys. Maybe we can do one more question real quick. I'm putting a bunch of videos together today. Javier says, thanks for all the info, wisdom, and advices. You're welcome. Yeah, it's nice to see you guys. I look forward to this, you know especially during this um, COVID-19 nonsense. You know, people get offended when I say that. They, they don't like me calling it nonsense, right? I'm supposed to take it serious. Um, but, yeah, I won't even go into that. Yeah, Anthony, nice to see you guys again. Gabriel. Yep, all right. Well, good. We'll see you guys next week. I think I might take the week off that I'm playing at the Renaissance Festival, okay? Bye, Alex. Nice to see you again. <laughs> no, it's okay. You don't have to be sorry. He says, sorry for calling it a cheater, mouthpiece. I was pulling your leg, man. <laughs> I was pulling your leg. It's all right. We all know what you're talking about. All right. Okay. God bless you guys. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you guys next time. All right. Bye.